Hello, I'm Joe Campbell, and you're welcome to the Miami Show Band Peace Center Online, the Truth and Reconciliation Platform Project. Opinion our Speaking for Myself series, our witnesses today are Fagan Murray, whose 29-year-old son Martin was among the 22 people murdered in a suicide attack at the Ariana Grande concert at Britain's Manchester Arena on 22nd of May 2017. Travis Strain, who was seriously injured in the Westminster Bridge attack on March 22nd, 2017, where four people died and more than 50 people were injured. Our executive producer and a co-founder of TARP, Eugene Reby, joins us from White Cross in County Armagh, and the Truth and Reconciliation Platform co-founder and chairman, Stephen Travers, joins us from our Cork City studio. You're all very welcome. Fagan, uh, yes. could, could we start with you, please? Uh, okay. Can you please tell us your story? Oh, gosh, where do I begin? So um, life was pretty okay. My five children were growing up and uh, I was just sort of um, happily working from home as a psychotherapist. And the day my son died was no different. I'd been working um, and I didn't feel well that day. I wasn't ill, but felt under the weather, went to bed early, and I was woken up about um, 20 to 11 that evening by one of my daughters who said, I'm just checking your mobile phone to see if Martin texted you. And I didn't understand why Martin would be anywhere on a Monday night, but anyway, she told me then that he was at a concert, and she, she just said there's been an incident and that's and when I pushed her, she then said, Mum, there's been an explosion. And I literally ran past her down the stairs. My husband was just stood by the television watching the news flash with people screaming and running in the arena in, in the foyer. And um, there was absolute chaos on the on the television uh, screen. And I said, Martin is there and his mates can't find him. And he said to me, well, look, this, this, this arena holds 20,000 people. You know what he's like. He'll have left early. He'll be getting drinks in from for his mates. Don't worry. Anyway, I've got work. I'm going to bed. And off he went. So my daughter and I obviously stayed up and watched the news. And we kept getting messages saying, has he phoned yet? Has he called? Has he texted? And um, so... Unfortunately, obviously, none of that happened. And about, I'd say about quarter past 11, um, I turned around to my daughter and I said, look, he's dead. And, and the reason she was, she was horrified. But the reason I said that is that I just literally had this feeling that suddenly there was absolute radio silence. I couldn't have any sense of him. I couldn't sense him. I couldn't feel him. It, it's as if somebody had cut off the connection. Um, and I just absolutely knew he, he was gone. Um, unfortunately, we were not officially told that until uh, 24 hours later that evening because they couldn't take the bodies out straight away until the following evening about six o'clock um, because the roof wasn't safe and obviously they needed to do their forensic st stuff. So. Um, we had a long, long wait, and then they needed to identify the different people who'd passed away. Um, so that was the end of Martin's life. Um, and it was obviously life-changing for us as a family. It was devastating. Um, one of my children couldn't go to uni. Um, I could, unfortunately, after 23 years of being in my job, no longer do therapy, offer therapy to people. I still to this point can't, and I don't think I ever will go back to my job. Um, so yeah, our life has completely changed really um, beyond recognition. Oh, that's uh, tra tragic, Fagan. Could, could you tell us a little bit about Martin? Martin was uh, larger than life, uh, and I'm not just saying that because I'm biased as his mum. He was really uh, a force to be reckoned with. He was very, very kind, very caring, and one of his biggest assets was his sense of humour. Uh, he 
he was a, a social media persona in his own right. He made people laugh all the time. Um, I, I do remember one day shortly after he died, I uh, woke up very early about six in the morning. It was summer and I thought, you've not cried yet properly. Get, get your iPad out and get a box of tissues and a cup of tea and watch him on YouTube and have a good cry. And for about an hour and a half, I couldn't cry. I did nothing but laugh at all the funny, funny, many clips that I saw. I just could not shed any tears. He was just so comical as a person. Um, and he had the ability to see the funniest things in the most mundane, ordinary things in life and make them look funny. So that was Martin. Hi. How has life been since then after after the initial uh, tragedy? Well, um, we, we moved house since, and that wasn't because Martin died. We had already sold our house, but as the universe would have it, it's a good thing that, that we did move house. Um, I didn't have to stay in the house that was full of childhood memories of him. I can't even bear to go to the same town now. Um, it's just too painful. Um, as far as my job goes, as I said earlier, I, I no longer work as a therapist. I am now doing a master's in counterterrorism. And the reason I did that is because I needed to understand what made a human being go and do such an act and kill not just himself, but lots of innocent people. Until that day, I knew nothing about terrorism. I was so terribly ignorant, I'm ashamed to say, that I'd watch it on, on news on, and in films and, and particularly on the news, I thought this happens to other people. This isn't, you know, this isn't, it's never, it's, it's never gonna be my reality. And there you are, it has become our reality um, and we are in the thick of it. So, um, you know, it, it's completely transformed life for us. The, the the death and injury toll on on the evening uh, Fagan was uh, horrific. Twenty two people uh, murdered, and almost eight hundred people injured. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I don't think uh, people understand just the impact that that has on families, wider family circle, communities, days. Mm -hmm. What support did, did you get from the uh, from the wider community and the authorities in the days, weeks, months, and a couple of years since then, Fagan? Mm. Um, so obviously, you know, it, it has, like you said, not, not just impacted the bereaved families. The concert was mainly visited by young teenage girls because that was the fan base for Ariana Grande mainly. And I'm in touch with quite a lot of these young ladies and a lot of them are still after nearly four years, terribly suffering and traumatized, you know. Um, as for us, I, th I think um, I speak for all families really who've been bereaved and, and injured. The outpour of love and support in Manchester has been phenomenal. Um, and I think the arena was such a venue that nearly every family in Manchester at some point in their life has been visiting um, for be it Disney on ice or any other rock concert or sports event. Uh, it's been such a popular venue and such so much part of Manchester. I think the people of Manchester took it as a personal attack to, on their city and therefore the outpouring was incredible. Um, so many people have said to me, oh my gosh, that could have been us. We were there last week, we were there last month. Uh, so people are aware that, you know, it could have happened any any time to anyone. Um, the people of Manchester, the, the, the symbol of the Manchester Bee, um, they have really taken that on board. I myself have a bee tattoo. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> um, so um, a lot of people got bee tattoos um, as a sign of solidarity and love for for the people who've been affected. And the B symbol is still very strong anyway, but since the attack, you go to Manchester, you'll see bees everywhere, you know? So um, yeah. the love was definitely what helped us through. Yeah. 
And uh, I think Eugene and, and Travis and I had the opportunity to see the, the choir. Ah, yes. The Survivors Choir. choir uh, fantastic. Uh, and, and, and I guess that's helping a lot of the people who were directly or indirectly involved cope with uh, what happened. Yes, I am so grateful to Kath Hill, Dr. Kath Hill, actually, um, that she has set up this choir because um, therapeutically it has been so helpful to so many of the young people who've joined that choir. Um, and, and you know, they go there, these young, young people go there. I mean, some of the parents are there as well, obviously. But everybody who goes and attends the choir just goes there to sing and be together. They, didn't, they don't need to talk about the attack. They all know how the other person feels because they feel the same. So yes. it's a therapeutic value being a member of the choir and you don't need, it's all unspoken, but they are together and supporting each other without words, really. Yeah, I think, I think that's what, um, what we experience in TARP is, is the empathy among victims. You don't have to say anything. Precisely. You speak and after two sentences, it's like you've known each other forever. Yeah. Again, I, I was I was I was interested there when you said that you're you're studying counterterrorism as a master's try and understand uh, how how somebody could commit such an act. Have you got any thoughts about that now that you want to share with us? Yeah, um so I I when the attack happened, I uh, obviously we didn't have the television on because everybody was grieving like mad and the house was busy with police and undertakers and goodness knows it was like Piccadilly Circus. It was really, really busy the house. So the TV was off, but somebody kept buying newspapers. And uh, I happened to walk past the dining room table on day three, I think it was. And on the top of the pile was a the front page of that paper had the perpetrator on the front page. And I stood and froze and I thought, oh my goodness, you're so young. He was only about 22, 23 years old. And I thought, what would somebody so young understand about doing that kind of act? Why on earth would you have done that? And that combined with about less than three weeks later. Um, and again, I hadn't been watching the news until then at all. So one morning, Less than three weeks later, I found myself on my own in the kitchen. Everybody had started going back to uh, work and college and school and whatever. So I was on my own for the first time and I bought The Guardian and had it in front of me about to have my breakfast. And I saw this picture with five men and I read the article and it was a picture of five men from Finsbury Mosque in London who had formed a human chain around this guy on the floor. And when I read the details, it was obviously Darren Osborne who tried to kill Muslims who came out of the prayer prayers that day. Yeah. And um, um, and these five men in all that chaos and, and uncertainty of the moment, they instinctively formed a human chain around this guy and protected him from the people behind him who obviously were angry and wanted to hurt him. And that that then made me think, gosh, that is really powerful. So the first thing I did was I went on national TV and I publicly forgave the terrorist who killed Martin and the others because I felt I needed that for me to retain my own power, to be able to uh, not absorb any anger. Um, and it, it felt that I could, with that forgiveness, carry on as a mother, grandmother, wife. Uh, otherwise, I probably would have not functioned as well but actually I felt really at peace with myself that I did that uh, although I got criticized so after that I I thought well I need to know why young people of that age would would do that and how they even get to that point and I realized I knew zero about terrorism and I got really curious about it so I needed to understand the thought processes, the history behind terrorism. I needed to understand all these connections. And I feel I'm in my second year of the, and final year of my master's now. And I feel so, so much better informed now. And 
I know um, that that it was the right action for me to do the course. Not that I'm going to do anything with it other than carry on working with, with children in, in schools um, to try and educate them about the dangers of radicalization. Um, I'm, I'm 60 next week, so I'm not going to get a job at my age in counter-terrorism. Maybe 20 years ago I would have done. But I'll, I'll, do, I'll continue doing my bit with much better of an understanding. Again, thank you very much. Um, Travis, please, could, um, could we ask you to uh, share your experience with us? Thanks, Joe. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, as was mentioned at the start, um, I was affected by the Westminster Bridge attack uh, on the 22nd of March, 2017. Um, I'm not from London. Uh, I was down in London on a three-day trip um, with my university. Um, from Lancashire originally. And um, it was just so happened that we we're on the second day of the trip. Um, so the 22nd of March sort of started like any other really, um, slightly hungover, but otherwise like any other, um, because we'd just arrived in London the night before. And um, so we spent the day sort of going around um, Parliament and, and similar sort of, you know, buildings and having meetings with MPs, um, because I was on a history with politics degree. So it was with the politics side of the course. And um, we, we just so happened to get half an hour of free time in the middle of the day. Um, one of the meetings that we'd had with an MP, um, you know, she had to shoot off because she had to go and vote on some sort of measure. Um, so we all sort of split up. There's about 16 of us, I think, on the trip, including our lecturer. And we all split up into different groups. Um, and uh, like I said, we had for half an hour, you see. So... A group of uh, a group of about four of us lads sort of split off from the rest of them. Some people stayed in the cafe. Some people went shopping. We decided to just get some fresh air, to be honest. Um, and we left Parliament and sort of started walking along the bridge. Now I didn't see the the car coming towards us at first because I was uh, on my phone. I was texting a friend, and um, and one of the other lads just sort of shouted something along the lines of Travis, look or look out. Um, but by the time I'd looked up and seen, you know, the, the four by four, the SUV coming towards me, there wasn't any time to, to react. Um, and essentially the guy had, you know, mounted the pavement with his, with his four by four and started hitting pedestrians. Um, so I ended up, we all got hit by the car. Um, very fortunately we all survived. Um, but I, I was hit, uh, sort of head on and went over the bonnet and into the air before landing on the concrete. Um, and the other lads in my group all got sort of glancing blows. Uh, and one lad, for example, got hit by the bumper, uh, which flew off the car, and another lad um, got hit by the wing mirror as well. And um, so I, I never, uh, never lost uh, consciousness well, uh, during the incident. Um, I was very fortunate that my head actually landed on the stomach of one of the other lads who'd already been knocked down, um, whereas the rest of my body that hit the concrete Every, every point of impact uh, ended up being fractured. So I was very lucky that my head was cushioned. Um, and I sort of got up immediately after, um, whether it be adrenaline or, or shock, um, I, I didn't feel any pain, uh, despite having um, a broken leg and various other injuries. And I remember my first instinct, um, there were two things that came to mind, and I guess it, it probably is the adrenaline sort of thrown for you. One of them was to find my phone, which had obviously been in my hand whilst I was texting. Um, and the other was to find my shoes because don't ask me why, but they'd flown off um, when I was hit by the car. Um, and I guess in that sort of state of shock, I started wandering around and obviously seeing the various injuries that had happened. Um, one lady had been uh, knocked under a bus, which had then obviously, um, you know, drove over. Her. Another lady had been knocked over and into the Thames. Um, and I, I, you know, collected my belongings. And that's when we noticed that one of the lads in our group was actually missing. Um, now, obviously, we're talking about a, a split second here, so we had no idea where he'd gone because, obviously, you know, we'd been hit by the car, and like I said, we didn't lose consciousness or anything. Um, people were shouting, someone's gone over into the river, and um, so instinctively, you know, we, we assumed that could have been him. And pretty soon after, I mean, the, the, I'd like to think, you know, that there could have been more we could have done, but people were on the scene pretty quickly. I remember the one of the first guys to respond was an off-duty police sergeant, um, who'd been on his way to pick up his daughters from school and he ran across the pavement whilst you know so many people were running away um, and sort of tried to start coordinating things and, and 
assessing people's injuries. Now, so instinctively, again, because the sort of adrenaline was flowing through, we couldn't feel any of the pain, or no, I certainly couldn't. Uh, we kept flagging all the officers on and saying, nope, you know, no issue with us, just carry on moving, uh, deal with us later, because obviously there's some really horrific injuries. Um, and uh, pretty soon after the adrenaline ran off, <laughs> to, to be quite honest, um, and uh, I felt the need to, you know, sit down and, and start taking this a bit more seriously. One of the other lads had a very visible injury on his head um, that we were applying pressure to. Um, and another of the lads had a, an injury to his arm, but he couldn't quite check what it was yet um, because his, his coat was on, he couldn't get it off. The only injury I was aware of at this time was actually my hand um, because as soon as I got up, um, from the concrete on the floor and looked at my hand because instinctively I was trying to take my coat off to apply pressure to his wound. Uh, every finger by the thumb on my left hand was pointing in a different direction. Um, all twisted, mangled, out of, out of place. It was disgusting. Um, to this day, I still say, despite the other injuries I received, it is the most horrific because it was visible. It was something that, you know, you never get that image out of your head. Um, and um, pretty soon after, you know, they started moving people off the bridge, started tagging people, giving them different trauma cards, depending on, uh, you know, their assessed injury. And the police were on the scene pretty quickly. Um, we had a, a police constable who had come from Lambeth. Um, they sort of bussed everyone in on a, on a, you know, just chucked everyone in a van and got there as soon as they could. Um, because the, the first police officers that attended, um, which were these motorbike coppers, that I don't know if you're aware, but London has these fast response uh, armed uh, motorbike coppers. And obviously they arrived and before they could even attempt to, you know, triage the injuries, they were already hearing gunshots over in uh, the Palace of Westminster. So they had to run off and address that, which was obviously the attack still ongoing. Um, but pretty soon after the, you know, the paramedics and the police started arriving, um, the other lads in my group were walked off the bridge as, as walking wounded because a staging area had been set up in a hotel nearby. But by this point, it was pretty clear that I couldn't couldn't walk. Um, so I was left on the bridge, you know, foil blanket, etc., uh, while they were addressing my injuries. Now, at this stage, because I was, you know, led down on the floor, I felt like I had an injury in the sort of hip area. Um, later, I'd, I'd find out very luckily that actually... Um, it was just bruising, very bad bruising that I had. And because I was laid down on it, it was causing that to be the most obvious injury. But what actually happened was they started, um, you know, cutting open my clothing and stuff to, to check the different injuries. Um, and pretty soon it became clear that there was a very bad uh, laceration on the left leg, which I simply just wasn't aware of. Again, we call it adrenaline, call it shock. Um, but the more they uncut you know, the different layers of clothing, the more it was sort of matted with blood. Um, and so pretty soon after I started to go into shock, I, I do think as well that the more aware you are of the injuries you've got, the more you feel it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they got me on a stretcher, moved me to the end of the bridge um, and, uh, you know, started pumping me with all sorts of, uh, of um, painkillers. Um, thank God for that. And um, they got me in the back of an ambulance and, Within about half an hour, 40 minutes, um, I was at King's College Hospital, which is the trauma centre for London. Um, now, that, that was only what I can describe as essentially a war zone in there. Um, you know, the, the way this trauma centre had been set up, you know, it wasn't aesthetically pleasing by any means. It was meant for purpose and for use. Um, and they wheeled me in and, you know, it was basically all the sort of serious injuries in one room. Um, you know, no curtains or anything. You've got doctors moving between patients, assessing. And I was pretty much told as soon as I got through the door, just stay still and let us do our job. And I had, you know, 10 doctors and nurses moving me about, manhandling me. But, you know, it was absolutely impeccable um, health treatment. And um, it became pretty clear. Um, you know, I had a whole range of different scans and things. Um, and it became pretty clear that I had um, a fracture in the leg as well as a torn ligament um, and I also had um, the laceration and obviously the broken fingers as well as a broken hand um, and obviously various sort of soft tissue injuries bruising etc so um, the first thing first order of business obviously was to um, you know fix the wound the laceration and sew that up as well as 
a very painful local anesthetic operation on the hand to realign all the fingers. And I remained in hospital for eight days after the incident. Um, I had another operation where they inserted a screw into my leg um, under general anesthetic, obviously, to repair the ligament um, and then was discharged home. Now, I guess just sort of fast forwarding in, um, one thing that has always sort of stuck with me um, after the incident was, and it's something that I've sort of focused my time on uh, since then, has been a sort of disparity in support. Um, as I've mentioned, whilst I was in London, you know, the police, the NHS was fantastic support. Um, but as soon as I had the, you know, the patient transport back up to Lancashire, it was sort of like that. The, the, the support just dropped off. Um, I was dropped off my house and just told, um, you know, ring your local police station to sort of coordinate, um, coordinate your ongoing case um, and, and ring your GP to coordinate your medical. Um, now, obviously, this wasn't sufficient. I mean, I didn't know this at the time, but it became very clear it wasn't sufficient. Whilst I was in hospital, I was getting daily visits from the police who were updating me on the case, updating me on um, all manner of different, um, you know, incidences relating to it. And then as soon as I got back to Lancashire, there wasn't a, there wasn't a case officer, there wasn't a liaison officer with the police, I didn't have a point of contact. And let me tell you, you know, you try, I live in quite a rural area, small town, you try walking into a small town police station and asking for details on a national terrorism case, and it's just not going to happen. Um, and the same pretty much went for the GP as well. I mean, you know, it took a good two, three weeks to get an appointment in the first place. So by that time, I was already well overdue for a number of different sort of checkups. Um, by the time I got the physio, which again, there was a waiting list for, by the time I got the physio, it was non-contact, um, which I'd never heard of non-contact physiotherapy before. <laughs> um, mm. And um, and uh, the, the same pretty much goes for um, the psychological side of things as well. It wasn't something that I felt I necessarily needed early on. The main thing I did feel I needed was someone just to talk to, really, someone who wasn't, you know, family or friends who obviously were, were really, really supportive. But at the same time, I didn't want to necessarily cause a sort of secondary traumatization, really, by saying these sort of gory details to them. Um, and that just wasn't wasn't really available. We wasn't really someone to talk to. Um, it was 12 weeks on a waiting list um, just to get assessed, never mind to talk to someone. Um, and it pretty much carried on going downhill from there. Now, I was very fortunate about three, maybe four months after I believe it was, um, that we had a set of pro bono solicitors um, get in touch um, through a, a foundation that were assisting us. Um, because I should say, you know, there were a number of charities that were attempting to fill the gaps um, and they got in touch um, and basically offered to represent us for free. And that was a massive, massive um, step forward, really, because they were able to represent us, get us funding for physical therapy. Unfortunately, you know, through the, the private physical therapy that they were able to acquire, I, I was able to regain full usage of both the hand and the leg. Um, and in terms of the other lads, I've just realized as well, I should add that I, I never explained what happened to uh, the other lad in our group on the bridge who was missing. Um, and it brings me sort of full circle, really. Now, he'd received a more glancing blow and, and sort of in shock at seeing what he'd seen, had ended up just walking and, and sort of in autopilot mode and hadn't realized where he was until two or three hours later um, when he was wow. found in a pub in Vauxhall, um, which is miles away. Um, nice. and, and he had no idea how he got there. Um, it's just the police rang the pub and because you know they, they, they saw him in there covered in blood and, and sort of asked how he got there. Um, but fortunately, you know, as I said, I think the main thing to remember is we all survived, um, and that's something that I think you know is, is something that will always, um, will always you know stick with you in, in terms of the sense of, and I know this is probably shared by a lot of other victims as well, and that I can't just. I personally feel now anyway, I can't just go back to how I was before. I, I resonate very much with what Fegan uh, was saying earlier in terms of before this happened, I had no sort of knowledge of terrorism, no sort of even interest for lack of a better phrase. Um, it was something that, again, you saw on the TV and for a few minutes you might think that's sad and then switch over the channel. And that's, that's an awful thing to say, but it's the truth for a lot of people, I think, in this country and, and in the, you know, the wider world. Um, I don't want to get too deep, but I think especially with social media as well, it's, it's very easy to sort of see something 
and, and think you've achieved something meaningful by just clicking like or sure and, and then moving on with your life. Um, and so it's something that I I feel anyway, personally, I can't I can't just move on from. Um, I have to, you know, again, similar to Fegan, um, I've just actually finished a master's degree uh, in international military history where I studied terrorism because I, I had to, I had this sort of compulsion that I had to understand and I'm not saying you can understand because, you know, there is no sort of reasoning behind these, these incidents, but I had to understand how, you know, what the background was and what the history was to, to where we are today, the situation. And that was something that really, for me, was quite an eye-opening opportunity. Um, yeah. And that sort of brings me to where I am today, really. Yeah. That was a, an horrific experience uh, for, for one so young, um, you know, with, uh, with, with a group of peers. Some of the things that you see and that you experience, you can never... You can never forget, you can never delete those things from your mind. And I was struck by something that you said there in terms of the support that you got from charities. And I, 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 I had heard someone say that the success of the charities emphasizes the failure of government and society to support victims of terrorism. Absolutely. I mean, look, at the end of the day, in an ideal society, we wouldn't have need for for these sort of sites, you know, these, these charities to struggle and, and try and sort of fill the gaps, really. I mean, one of the, beyond the sort of formal charity structure, one of the the main sources of support I felt anyway over the past few years has been from other victims. It's been peer support. Yeah. And that was, that was a big thing for me because, again, one of one of the issues in terms of the support that, that we experienced with Westminster was... Um, that there was never any sort of commemorations um, on the anniversary. We had a very sort of international group of victims. Um, if I remember right, British victims were actually in the minority because it was such a tourist area. You know, we had people from South Korea, Japan, um, America, France, Spain, you name it, Italy. Um, it was very difficult then um, w without there being a sort of formal service on on the anniversary it was very difficult for us as victims to ever actually meet each other, to ever communicate with each other, uh, to ever even know what each other's names are, because you have to think, you know, only a fraction of people will ever sort of reveal that they've been in an attack like this. I had that, um, that choice sort of taken away from me because I still don't know how to this day, but my name was, was out there, you know, in, in the newspapers and on social media within hours of the attack happening. Um, but a lot of people, my friends included, have, have chosen to remain anonymous. So it was very difficult for us to meet other people affected by that same attack. Um, but then through through events, you know, um, organised by these by these charities, and through uh, just sort of by chance bumping into people on social media and things, and at events, you know, I've been able to meet a very wide range of people, you know, yourself included. Um, from around the world who have been affected by very different, you know, very different um, situations, but also very similar. And, and yeah. again, it's that sort of unspoken, you can be in a room with these people. It's hard to explain again, but yeah. you can be in a room with these people and it's not like anyone needs to announce what's happened to them. It's just a sort of mutual bond. Um, and that's really yeah. powerful. And I, I think it's, it's, Again, it's hard to understand un unless you've sort of been in that scenario. But for me, it was definitely a, a massive, massive source of support for me because it was knowing that I wasn't going through this alone, even though it felt like it without those yeah. official support mechanisms in place. You know, uh, Travis shouldn't have to ring his GP. He shouldn't have to, you know, have online physiotherapy. You know, never mind the financial support because of the impact the economic impact that being a victim of terrorism has on your life. Um, you know, we all get the grand statements from politicians and the hats on the shoulder and the cup of tea and all the rest, but cup of tea doesn't help you to live. You know, we're doomed to repeat the past until we can learn sensible lessons that don't cost an awful lot of money. And it's difficult, isn't it? Because like you said, you know, the, the argument should be that it doesn't cost a lot of money because, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it is a sort of prevention is better than cure. And I think yeah. by funding this up front, you are already, 
you know, sort of addressing what may come in future in terms of yeah. the, the expenditure. And I think, again, a frustrating thing is, as you said, you know, the UK should sort of have a, a handle on this. It should have a grip on this by now. Um, we, we see France, for example, you know, I'm not going to say it's perfect, but they certainly have, it certainly seems anyway that they've got a better idea of, of, of what needs to be done. And they certainly look like they're addressing it for a start, you know, and, and I think that's yeah. the first step to the first step towards sort of fixing it is to mm. even accept that there is an issue. And I don't think we're even at that stage in the UK yet. It seems yeah. to be an issue that sort of, you know, not to be crass, but it comes up every time there's an, an attack and then it goes back to the wayside and there's always something else. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, Fegan, um, I'm sure you, you can talk about Martin's Law in that sense as well, because these are simple sort of, well, not simple might be overestimating it, but in the grand scheme of things, again, I do think these are relatively, you know, simple, I'll put it that way, changes that can be brought in and, and make a massive change from what is, you know, quite frankly, a little bit of effort. And I think as much as... Um, you know, and, I, and I'm sure you guys will resonate with this as well. As much as, uh, you know, I would never complain about the fact that we're we're sort of campaigning about these issues, whether it be victims' rights, whether it be Martin's mm. Law, um, in the in the case of Fegan, I'd never complain complain about that because that's that's where the passion is. That's where we feel we need to sort of address this so that people in future don't have the same issues. Yeah. It still is pretty remarkable that it's always us having to lead the charge on this. Yeah. Uh, it's not the people who are usually in salaried positions quite you know high up um, but that's where i'll leave it anyway <laughs> stephen is there anything else you'd like to add before we wind up what makes me very sad about this and about this conversation is that all these years almost half a century in in, in our case yeah has gone by the authorities don't care about victims and that is the that is the the bottom line when we look at the victims pension and there are concerns about all aspects of the economy, and yet they can't find the, uh, the money to pay uh, these few victims that, uh, whose numbers have been well depleted at this stage. And what's very sad about this is that even incidents like this that happened in central, central London and, and, and in one of the biggest cities uh, in, 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 in the UK, in Manchester, they still haven't got... got uh, anything in place. Um, both of you, uh, you speak about pro bono. Why should you have to go cap in hand to, uh, to, uh, to solicitors to, uh, to help you get through this and to get through the, this quagmire that is uh, um, the, the, uh, the, the legalities and all of these inquests and, and all of these things. Again, just down the road from, from you, Fegan, you've got uh, Birmingham. The, bear, the victims of the Birmingham bombings have had to go cap in hand uh, and, and, and get somebody uh, to, to do to uh, deal with their cases pro bono. And they've had to go and fundraise and victims that are barely mobile in some cases have done sponsored walks and wheelchair walks and all this kind of thing. And it happens again and again. And yet the state itself mm -hmm. is awash with money and they have the masses masses of resources uh, to deal with these things themselves and they just throw the victims under the bus every single time as if we were an inconvenient truth so i think that's what we are Stephen. you know there should be a mechanism in place because you know we always talk about lessons need to be learned boris johnson said that about after the reading stabbings uh, we need to learn the lessons and every time that is my most hated sentence lessons yes. need to be learned yeah. because n nothing ever happens there should be an automatic mechanism in place like the people who are damaged uh, n through no fault of our own it's the government who has an obligation to look after us all really and they're not doing that there should be an automatic system in place with compensation psychological help legal help Whatever help there is yeah. that's needed should be there. And just in case people get the wrong impression, um, you know, you talk about, you know, uh, being looked after and that uh, some people might, might question uh, any, any uh, idea of compensation for these, these events. But the thing is, 
being looked after is one thing, but it was the duty, the duty of mm. the of the government, yeah. not just to look after you, but to prevent this happening. This In is what first... people forget. Yeah. Uh, it's a yeah. failure of the government. It's a failure yeah. of the authorities that the millions and billions that's put into national security <laughs> should have prevented this. So the compensation isn't just a handout for charity. The compensation is because of the failure of the state mm -hmm. to protect its own citizens. Precisely. And it goes in hand in hand with the Human Rights Act number Article 2, Article the right, right to life. And, you know, there's the right to life for Martin and the others and yeah. everybody else who dies in the hands of terrorists or mm -hmm the right you know you got injured Travis and and all of this shouldn't have happened and I as a lay person shouldn't have uh, my my persona all over the internet in desperation to get Martin's law done I'm I'm shouting and singing about it all over the all, all over social media just to get this law off the ground mm -hmm. and I have been doing that Travis two years now and it still hasn't happened okay. they're still dragging their feet I bring it full circle I think one of the biggest issues behind all of this um, is just the fact that, again, you know, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but it's the fact that most people just don't think it will happen to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's it. You know, I, I mentioned before the, the analogy with the TV, sort of switching the channel sort of thing, but mm -hmm. I think it, it applies across the board, whether we're talking about victims' rights, about justice, or even about Martin's Law. You know, people just don't think, and I think again, you know, there's part of society that doesn't think it's not going to happen. You know, it's not going to happen to them. But I also think there's a part of society that actively sort of thinks, well, you know, it, it's it's just it, it only happens to a few people, and that's yeah. that's that's not an issue, um, or it only happens in a faraway land, it, like it's some sort of fairy tale. Um, and I think that's the number one sort of barrier, the number one obstacle that we face in in all the issues we mentioned on the on the call tonight. It's the number one barrier we face in trying to overcome those issues. But when we talked earlier about um, religion and terrorism, I once heard this saying that I really think is helping me to, to come to terms with what happened in a way. And that's the say, somebody said, um, it's not religion that terrorizes, sorry, that radicalizes people. It is people who radicalize religion and, and that really, I find that a really good saying. Thanks to Fagan Murray and to Travis Frayen and to my top colleagues, Eugene Reavy and Stephen Travers. And special thanks to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and to Tracy Dempsey for their continuing support. Please visit our website, tarp.global, where you'll learn more about the work of Truth and Reconciliation Platform. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Right. Thank you for having us.